Welcome to an introduction to Project Skydirect, a StatFX learning demo. Let's get started with the introduction of some of the projects. As you see, you might have seen that we have something which is called Project Titan and Project Grot. With Titan, we created this sci-fi city using Houdini tools, and with Project Grot, we created this lava cave with also Houdini tools in Unreal. This time, we're also going to use Houdini and Unreal, but we want to have a stylized twist to it. We want to make sure that everything we build is to focus on making a stylized scene. So our tools need to make sure that they output or work with a stylized way. And all the texturing also we want to do as much as we can in Houdini with the new Copernicus toolset. So let's take a look at how our scene looks like. So as you saw, this is what we've created over a couple of weeks time. This is our main scene, our main shot. And again, the focus is on making something, a cool, impressive scene with a stylized uh, feel to it. Also, as the name suggests, Project Skylark, which is a bird, we let us inspire with birds. So we have the bird tower, but also lots of birds are flying around. Again, done using some Houdini tools. We also have then the nice little bridge with the cat on top of it. And also here, a nice little cozy store where we also have lots of props that were generated using it. So that's our scene. That's how our scene looks like. And let's now talk a bit more about how we made the tools or how many tools are created. I can give you a list of all the tools that we have, like a building tool, the fences, the wooden construction, bridges, birdhouse, the bird, the bottles, the clouds, the wind trails, the trim sheets, the forge, and many more. You can see that lots of elements and assets are created with Houdini in mind. Placing some of these on the scene itself, we can start from the top left corner. We have the bird houses to generate different versions. We have the trees, the clouds, all the buildings and the houses are done with the Houdini tool. We then at the bottom have the bridges, the wooden constructions, the fences, and a few more little tools for the bottles and the pots uh, to create all of that again in a more procedural way. If you're not familiar with these procedural tools and how they look like, here is an example of that in Unreal. So we have this tool, the birdhouse generator, and it allows us to change in Unreal how the feel and looks of it goes. So here we can change how many entrances it has for birds. We can also change the shaping and the feel again to our need. So we can dynamically in the editor tweak the geometry or the asset. And this can help us to more art direct what we want or to again create more variation. We don't want to have the same birdhouse over and over. We want to have many different birdhouses throughout the scene. Here is another tool inside of Houdini where we can here generate these plans by just tweaking the curve. So I can just draw the curve and I can define how this asset should look like or how many different assets I can get. So I hope this gives you an idea of like having these couple tools that allows us to generate different assets. So we can actually create a bunch of these assets in only a few minutes and we have then nice little variation into our scene. I also like to mention some of the team and the people behind all of this. We have a core team consisting out of four people, and we also had help from uh, Sinai and George. I'm Simon, I'm the project lead. I'm just helping out leading the project, but also jumping in where you need it. We all then have Leah, which is the art lead, 
on the project. She used all the tools to make the final scene and compositions and so on. We have Julian, which is a Houdini artist and made lots of the wooden structures, bridges, fences and so on. Then we also got Morn and he made the building generators to create all the buildings. Then we also had help from Sinai, who is at SideFX. He created the uh, bird animation, so all the birds flying in the scene are done by his drawing. And then we also had help from George, who works on Natsura, which is a toolkit or a notes toolkit in Houdini to generate foliage and trees and so on. So we had help from him to create some of our foliage in the scene. And that's sort of our team or the people that were involved in making this. Let's now take a more look at production and our timelines. This is sort of how our timeline looked like. So we have four months and each month we went into a different stage. We started roughly in January where we defined pre-production, blocking out the scene and just researching lots of things. As usual, we're going to start out with the reference board and just try to get a sense of what we want and what we would like to see. From that, I created an initial block out in Unreal. So by using simple shapes, I wanted to create a block out so we have roughly an idea for the team, what it should look like. I also wanted to make a smaller initial block out that was more focused on the exploration of the style. So I made a simple building or I generated the simple building and I placed some materials that I've built in Copernicus on top of it. So I have a feel of what we could build. So using this scene, I then swapped my initial block out into this. So I built a couple little tools, like a building tool, some fences, some bridges. So very simple tooling that already lifted up my block out from a simple block out to something that looks visually a bit more interesting to get my idea close. This was sort of still again, the block out stage. After that, we entered February. In February, this is where we're going to start production, get a team on board and define everything we want. The first things that Leah did was exploring more composition and art style. So she also made different light scenarios and different feelings in the scene, what we wanted to have, which you can see here. We also started to get some of our tooling into Unreal as well. So this is the first look at some of our tooling where we can have the wooden constructions and some of the bird houses in Unreal. We also had some very early shots from the building tool as well, where we, where, we, where this was still full in progress. It, start, it already started to look great. Once we enter March, we already have everything kind of there. It's not perfect yet. And that's where March was the focus. It's mainly about polishing. After the tool is polished, it will nicely work in real, for example, like the wooden bridges. So you can just draw the curve and you can see it will automatically snap the fitting bridge or the area that we want. After our toolings are integrated into Unreal, we have our scene that looks like this. So all the tools are now getting into our scene. So we have all the buildings, the bridges, some of the foliage, some of the clouds, some of uh, everything we basically have is now into the scene. So you can see our scene starts to get shaped. It's not final yet. As you see from the final images, it still looks different, but we are getting very close to it. We also then can focus on little detail, like some of these props are also procedurally generated. So we can again focus on some of the details that are nice to have. Then we come to April, which is basically wrapping up as much as we could. And this is more a focus on the art direction. At this point, all the tools are done. All the Houdini work is kind of done. It's more about the art direction, the composition, changing the tools. I mean, in, in real, of course. Let's say if we don't like how a building looks, we can just use the tool to generate a different building. If we don't like how the wooden bridge looks or goes, we can always use the tool to different uh, to generate a different version. So having these procedural tools allows us to quickly explore different ideas for the art team. And I also like to bring up the initial blockout that we had before. So going from this blockout to this, it's always nice to see the progress. And again, lots of deeper procedural tools were very useful to come to this stage. Now, a little bit more on some of our approaches. Here again, in a short matter, what we've did. We started out very small. The team itself is, is already not that large, but we even started out with a smaller team. The main idea is that we get the idea. We want to define the blockouts and the ideas like we only have one or two people working on this stage, so it's just mainly me and also some help from George. 
trying to define out what we were looking for. So trying to establish some of the ideas of what we want now in this project. And again, this is where we blocked out the scene and also where we blocked out some of our tooling. These tools are not perfect. These blockouts are not perfect. It's just a matter of fact of getting something there. It's not a focus on getting everything perfect at the moment. Some of the tooling are literally prototyped or made in an hour or so or even less. It's just a matter of the fact that it needs to be a base tool that can generate something usable for us to play around with. So we spent a few days, roughly one week, just trying to define as much as we could. After that phase is over, we then get the team on board. We can get the production started. This is where the blockouts become more useful. So, and I mentioned before, the blockouts don't necessarily file. But here we explore on what we could improve on those blockouts or on those tooling. We just openly discuss what we could improve to make the scene better. Something that I really stand for is that try to get as fast as you could your tools into the Unreal Engine. Because if you're making your tool, you're very often making it for another person, an artist. And you need to get feedback from them. And this way, by getting your tool as fast as possible into the editor, you will get feedback faster, which allows you for more focused iteration and focusing on the elements that will matter in the end. And to give you more context, all people on this project are having a full-time job and doing one day a week on this side project. And everyone can manage their own timing on this project as long as, of course, they, they, are, they are working on their tasks. Let's come into the texturing part, the tricky part. I want to discuss this a little bit and also a bit about Copernicus. So when you think about procedural models, it allows us to generate thousands and thousands of models in theory. We can also generate now a texture per model, but that means that we could have potentially a lot of different textures. So let's say you're making a tool, let's say a rock, and for each rock we made, we generate a texture. Let's say we have another tool and we generate something else and it generates more and more textures. So over time, we are creating many textures. If you are in a production, you're making a game and it takes three, four, five years to build a game. That means that this way you will create so many textures in your project that it might not be manageable at all. And of course, in games, we like reusing stuff. So the idea, of course, is that what if a tool could reuse texture? What if we have a texture for each tool? That could work. But more ideally is what if we built a nice little library with tidable textures and trim sheets and lots of reusable textures? That's often what we would like to do in games is reuse as much as possible so we don't have to create lots of different files or load in lots of different textures in our game. And trim sheets is very, very popular to be using. This is also what we've built as well. So the idea of a trim sheet is that we have these strokes and we will place them on a specific part of the asset. So this is our texture and our 2D asset that we had in the scene. So we're going to pick a stroke or a part of that texture and place it nicely on those wooden beams. And this way we can texture that asset without having to bake it uniquely down. So this can now be reused to other different wooden planks and other structures. Here is an example of how it looks in Houdini. So we have some UV data and we want to, and we want to match it into a specific direction, as you can see here. So we can match it perfectly on those areas of that trim sheet. So you will see it here that each of these strokes are now perfectly matched up to that texture. So all the UV data matches up nicely to that trim sheet that I had earlier. And this way, again, we can reuse this texture or this material to many different models and we don't have to create new and new textures every time. This automatically brings me to Copernicus or Cops in Houdini. If you're not familiar with this, in Houdini 20.5, they announced a new texturing toolset or the new and which processing tool set? Copernicus. These are nodes focusing on making procedural textures or styles. The main idea that you can see Copernicus is that anything that has to do with image processing can now be done using this new Copernicus tool set. Here are some examples. This is one of our networks that I've used to create a stylized trim sheet. You can see here that I'm pointing to what is called the importer and rasterizer. We now can directly import geometry and rasterize it or bake it into a texture. This allows us for a nice communication between our geometry and our textures easily. So you can see here that in our geometry layer, I actually just modeled the trim sheet in just a 3D way. 
So I just model this in 3D like you would normally would do. So placing a grid, slicing it into different strokes, and then I can bring that into Copernicus, into these texturing nodes, and I can get the height map and then use that to drive a procedural texturing like I have here. This is a custom node that I've built to add procedural texturing on these uh, inputs. And this way we can make multiple trim sheets if we want to. And in our project, a lot of our textures are done using Copernicus. And like I mentioned before, we were not really focusing on making very specific materials. We were always focusing on making reusable materials. So lots of these textures are tileable, reusable, like the rooftops or the procedural brush strokes or the trim sheet. Like lots of these elements, again, are just reusable along the project. Now let's wrap everything up into some summaries. First of all, blockouts are important. Not only blocking out the scene to have visually what we're going for, but also blocking out tools. Blocking out your tools to get the idea across how they look like and how they're functioning. Getting those tools as fast as possible in Unreal is always important to me. You want to have iteration and feedback as fast as we can get. Usually if you're building a tool, an artist or an art team will be using them. So you need to get feedback from them as fast as possible to iterate and focus on the features that they actually matter and not necessarily focus on features that won't uh, be used at all. Not all tools need to be complex, complexly approached. For example, the rock tool that I've built for this project is very simple. It's not an over-engineered rock tool that can generate very specific and complex shapes. It's just a simple sphere with some noises and fracturing on top of it. The main idea here is that you just need to build a tool as that is good enough for the scene. The rocks in the scene are just good enough and they look nice to work with a nice shader and some effects on top of it. I also see the potential of Copernicus. We are still currently at 3D 20.5, which is the first version of the new Copernicus toolset. And it does have lots of potential to be even bigger and bigger in games. So I really like using it and it's really great to see Copernicus. And the last point that I want to make is a small team that did great work. We were only a few people, only a few days a week, and we did really good work to create a neat, nice, stylized, impressive scene. And that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I will hope you will watch the tutorials soon from this project. Thank you.